Mr. Dennis Skinner. Yeah. 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 It's almost like history coming back again. In the mid 70s, I came down on the train and my whip told me that there would be a few tributes to Anthony Eden and then the house would finish for the day. And I thought, surely that's not fair. We're actually packing up because Anthony Eden, who was living in the Caribbean, had died and therefore the tributes would be paid and then the house would finish for the rest of the day. So I had an argument with the Labour whip and then I went in for the tributes. I'm not so sure I thought at the time it'd be a good idea for me to say anything because as sure as night followed day I'd not been here very long and a lot of people were going to make these tributes to Anthony Eden whom some of them had obviously never seen. So it's not as if this thing hasn't happened before. And I act actually proclaimed, having been a miner for 20 odd years, I said, when I worked down the pit and somebody died, I said, what happened was that four people took him out on a trolley along the rails and they were allowed to go home and the rest of the pit continued to work because people like us had managed to secure a tiny agreement with the coal board to get £250 for the miner's widow. And on that basis, the rest of us went to work. Now, what I'm trying to convey is, just like then as now, for the people out there, that are having to suffer the austerity and the benefit cuts and the increasing costs for their own funeral. They're the people that concern me, just like in those days of 1975, it was the miners that had left behind to speak for them in Parliament. And I remember then all the Tories walking out the moment I made this kind of criticism. I suppose it's an indication of the split Tory party that some of them are staying today because <laughs> they've not followed the leader and indeed the leader hasn't ordered them out. But that, what it, that's what it is. Let's not kid ourselves. We're here talking about the thing that we sometimes suggest has gone away. Class. That's what it is. It's about class. And it's about the fact that people out there have to live their lives in a different way. And there's one rule for those at the top and there's another for those at the bottom. Yeah. It's never changed. I wish it had, but it hasn't. And so when I, when I heard about the chain of events, because that's what it was, it seemed to grow like topsy. First of all, there was going to be some sort of ceremonial funeral. And then the next thing, Mr. Speaker, I have to say it to you. I mean, you tell us that the chimes of Big Ben are going to stop. And then we hear about the fact that we're going to abandon Prime Minister's question time. I mean, what's it all about? That's why the people out there are angry. A lot of them. I'm not suggesting for a minute there's a majority. I never have. But I do believe that this government is out of touch with the people out there. And on a big scale, the people that are suffering in the same week when benefits were cut again. And so I think that we should have a Prime Minister's question time, of course. He's got number 13, and in the absence of that list, I've got about 15 in my pocket to ask. <laughs> of course we should have that, and the people out there would want us to put the case about how they managed to make ends meet. Those people that commit suicide because they're up to their neck in debt, because they've got so many callers knocking on the door. First it's Wonga and then it's God knows how many others. That's what's happening in our society amongst the working class. And I don't think there's any doubt 
whatever we think, that Mrs Thatcher was a divisive character. I am, but I'm not Prime Minister. <laughs> but I know that there is within a lot of us the desire to fight at the edges, to take extra parliamentary action and all the rest of it and that. What's wrong with that? But let's not give the impression that Margaret Thatcher was different, that she was cool with everybody. She had an agenda that the moment she got in, she actually got in on my birthday. <laughs> Way back. Yeah, I will. Yeah, give way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, I just wanted to make the point that Baroness Thatcher is actually laid yards away from us in her final night in this palace. And does the Honourable Member not think that just on this night, when she is only yards away, that in the name of nothing other than good taste, that maybe it might be as well that we called this to an end? Yeah. Well, well, I'm just making a statement about the fact that during the course of her parliamentary time, especially when she was Prime Minister, that she did, first of all, she was divisive in the sense that she got rid of all the wet so that then she can set about her agenda. And there's no question at all about that. I know that's got nothing to do with the question time being abandoned, Mr Speaker. I just say to the Honourable Gentleman that a moment or two ago he was very much on the issue of Prime Minister's questions, and I know that he will wish to return to that. Mr Dennis Skinner. But, you know, I don't need any lectures from Tories about what they do to Mrs Thatcher. Because I remember that night... And that following day, when she stood there, Aye. she had not had a night's sleep, and she was making the final speech in Parliament. And why was she making the final speech in Parliament? It's not because the Labour MPs had put a knife in her back. No question about that. A succession of Tory MPs had gone touring the night and said, I don't think you should run again for the second ballot. I mean, that's the truth of it. So whatever I'm saying here today does not compare to the fact that a woman who had won three elections in a row then suffered the indignity of being kicked out like a dog in the night by her own members of parliament. That's the truth of it. And so whatever I say today is minimal as compared to that. So, yes, I'd like to. Uh, I'd like to have question time tomorrow, of course. And that's why I've got a few prepared. <laughs> so I'll ask the leader of the house when he winds up, he might answer. One of them, undoubtedly, is to get rid of the bedroom tax. Yeah. Yeah. I also want to say to him, it wouldn't be a bad idea if we did something about agency workers. There's all this talk about immigration when the real problem in our society, the real problem in our society is the fact that now a majority of foreign people that come to this country are now being dictated to by agencies. And it's time we got rid of them. They're undercutting the indigenous workers. I worked with Poles in 1948 down the pit. And why was there no row? Why did nobody get waked up about the displaced persons, the Poles, the Ukrainians? Because they were in the union with us. And they also paid the same wages. And there wasn't an agency in sight. So that's another question that we could have put tomorrow. We could also have put a question about doing something now the country's skint like we did in 1945. Who caused the skint? In, yeah. It was caused by that great economic tsunami that swept across the world. And, and why did it sweep across the world? Because in 1999, Mrs Thatcher, in one of her last acts, 
talked about the brave casino economy and the big bang in the city and deregulation, that was the moment it began. We never knew the time when it would, when it would turn into a recession. But we knew that somehow or other, that system, that social society of instant gratification would cause a recession at some time. And that's when it all began. Just like with the share-owning democracy, we could have discussed that tomorrow. The share-owning democracy, when she sold off all the public utilities, this non-divisive character who said, we'll sell off all the public utilities, gas, electricity and all the rest, and everybody will have shares. You'll buy them off SID, and you'll be able to be part of that great British share-owning democracy. What happened to that? What happened to the share-owning democracy? EDF is now owned by French Electricity. Aon is be owned by German. Scottish Power is owned by Spain's Ibadola. N Power is owned by German RWE. Anglia Water has gone to Canada. Thames Water is owned by the Germans. Order, order. Can I, order. I'm, order. I'm trying to help the honourable gentleman. Order. Can I just say to the honourable gentleman, it's absolutely in order. It's relevant to the motion for the honourable gentleman to refer to matters that, if there were a question session, he would raise. In other words, he can raise the questions, but it's not in order for him also to provide the answers. <laughs> Mr. Dennis Skinner. Of course it is. So, who owns Orange and Mobile? Have a guess. France and Germany. Who owns Selner O2? Spain. Who owns Arriva Buses? German Deutsche Bahn. Ah, oh, yeah, I'll give way. I, I thank him for giving way. I'm, I'm listening carefully to his diatribe, I'm listening <laughs> carefully to his list of privatised utilities. And I suggest he gets a new researcher because the EDF. It stands for electricity to forms, and it's always been French for as long as it exists. <laughs> Can he get a new researcher, please, and put it out in his misery, not ours? Yeah, I think he's made his own case. Gatwick's owned by South Korea. Cadbury's is owned by the United States. The M6 toll is owned by Australia's Macquarie Bank. On and on it goes. So we could talk about bringing back the public utilities into public ownership. I mean, the whole concept of Thatcher was to divide and rule. She was also the one that said there's no such thing as society is probably the most in yes I know you like it that's why you're a thorn in the side of the leader of the, the Tory party now so I'm pleased that you're falling out and so what I'm saying is it's important to remember that the people out there know where Thatcher stood they've not forgot and in those communities where the shipbuilding was destroyed in the early 80s, and then in the steel industry at Corby and various other places that were smashed when she brought McGregor in, and then when she brought McGregor back and paid him one and a half million pound transfer fee to Lazard's bank in order to shut, they said, about 20 or 30 pits, and what happened in practice, we had 150 pits at the end of that 1985 pit strike, and by the time Thatcher went, there was only 30 left. That's why people out there are angry, and that's why they demand of us, a few of us, to speak the truth on their behalf. And that's why I'm all in favour of question time, because I've got a list of them that I'd like to ask every single week. So thanks, Mr Speaker, for giving me the chance to talk about this issue. It's not about personalities, it's about the fact that it's all about class. And we must never forget that. When we hear, we should remember where we come from. And I remember those people. I remember my own family. 
Nine kids hadn't got to eat me to rub together. It's still embedded in my soul. And that's why I speak as I do. And I don't want to change and never will. It won't get my hands on the dispatch box, but that's not a luxury that's ever bothered me. It's important to remember that these words of mine don't come out of my mouth because of envy, because of greed. It's because I believe that we have to look out, that look after those people that haven't got two apes to rub together. That should be what motivates us every day of the week, including Prime Minister's question time. And when the Labour Party understands that, like we do here today, it'll be better for it. Thank you very much.